Glad you could be here again this evening. We're continuing our study of 2 Timothy. Please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, please. We'll be beginning in verse 6 in just a few moments. As we're continuing the last letter that Paul wrote before his uh, execution, he wrote to the young preacher Timothy to encourage and strengthen him to be faithful even though Paul was suffering persecution for the preaching of the gospel and he assures Timothy that he and all faithful Christians will suffer persecution. Nevertheless, they must continue to do what's right. And so there's lessons for us, even as it was for Timothy, to continue to do right despite hardship. So the first chapter talked about the, uh, the example that Paul set, that he was strong in the faith and even when he was suffering. The second chapter talked especially about some problems involved in teaching. These last couple of chapters just discussed various dangers and so on, problems in general. Let me back up a little bit, okay? So that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. Before we uh, move further, let's do a little bit of a review. What about the first five verses in chapter 4? We talked about last week. He discussed a problem that he was concerned about. And what was the problem? What are some things he says about this, the problem that he's dealing with in the first five verses? Tell me something he talks about in those verses. Rick. Be ready to fight against false teaching. All right, so the problem of false teaching. And what effect would that, what does he say about the false teaching? What would the effect be? What would lead it to it? What does he say about it, the false teaching? Sharon. This false teaching doesn't just uh, come from the teacher who's uh, duping some other people. This one comes from the listeners who want to hear false teaching. Okay, so the problem he's discussing with is the fact that some people don't want truth. Uh, that is, they want to believe something other than what the Bible really says. And so they don't endure sound doctrine, he says in verse 3. Uh, they want teachers that will tell it the way they want it to be. And they would rather have fables rather than uh, have the, the truth. And so we discussed last time about uh, the, the problem that people will have following their own desires and uh, heaping up for themselves teachers, turning away from the truth and following fables. So what does he say was the solution? What was to be done when dealing with this kind of problem? Rebuke. Arnie says to re rebuke them. What else does he say? Susan? Continue to <coughs> preach the word, which is sound doctrine. All right. So preach the, the sound, the truth that, that the people really don't want, but whether in season or out of season, they still, that's, that's what people need. Whether it's what they prefer, what they would rather have something else is not, doesn't change what they really need. What they need is the truth. They need the word of God, and that's the only thing that can save souls. So compromising with the desires of people who want something else doesn't solve the problem. It simply makes more people involved in error. And so the solution, he says, then, is that to preach the word, whether it's popular or not popular, in season or out, rebuking sin, but also in encouraging people to do right, doing all this with long-suffering and being watchful. And they talked about, in verse 5, the, the willingness to endure hardship that he will need to suffer at times, and doing the work of an evangelist, fulfilling his responsibilities as a preacher. So sometimes this involves suffering. That's what the book is largely about. Even though Paul was suffering and Timothy would suffer, those who want to serve God faithfully must be willing to suffer in order to stand for the truth. That's the first five verses that we talked about last time. Questions or discussion anybody has on uh, those verses before we move on tonight? All right, let's go ahead and read some more. As we're drawing now to the close of the letter, um, a few more uh, significant lessons, and but then a lot of personal information. So let's go ahead and read some more before we uh, before we study further. Um, well, let's just read verses six through eight this time. About chapter four, verse six through eight. Who'd like to read that, please? Uh, Bill, please. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. <clears throat> I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. <laughs> Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord and the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Okay. So Paul is giving his final 
uh, instructions, and he's talking now about his what he what he expects for himself. What he as he looks back over his life, as you would tend to do, knowing that you're about to die, and looks back over his life, the things he's accomplished, and he looks forward to the future. And here are some things he tells us uh, about his hope and so on. So, first of all, uh, well, let's list them. First of all, what is, let's list the things he says. Verses 6 through 8. Let's list the things that he says. What is something he says about his life at this time? Tell me something he says. Bill. He's been poured out as a drink offering. Oh, he's been poured out as a drink offering. What does that mean? What's the idea of a drink offering and Paul being poured out? It? Obviously, it's not literal. It's In some sense, it's uh, symbolic. What's the significance? Sacrifice. On a sacrifice, under the Old Testament, one of the kinds of sacrifices that they had was that they would take some valuable uh, substance, a perfume or something like that, and pour it out on the altar as an offering, a sacrifice to God. So what is that? how does that relate to Paul? What does he mean when he says he's going to pour out, be poured out as a drink offering? What's the point of the illustration, Terry? Uh, I think the wording, at least in the English standard, New English Standard, I am already being poured out, indicates that Paul's life has all been giving all that he has to the Lord and serving the Lord emptying himself of, of everything that he has to give to the Lord. Okay, interesting point in approach it. Throughout his life he's been pouring himself out as a drink offering, but it's almost over. He's reaching the end of it, of this offering. Uh, other comments on the idea of uh, life being like pouring out a drink offering. Okay, and at the end, um, what's left is uh, is an empty body that is nothing left, fit, but physically his body because he's he's poured out all that he has to serve the Lord, and he says the time of his departure then is at hand. Okay, what else does he say in the following verses describing his uh, his effort, his life? Something else he says. Bill. He fought a good fight, he finished the race, and he kept his faith. All right. So let's talk about those things for a little while. He says he fought the good fight, he's finished the race, he's kept the faith. Okay, so I ask you on each of these points, uh, question number 12, to give some other passages relating to these. Uh, so let's talk about each of these. What does he mean when he talks about he's fought the good fight of faith? And what are some other passages that talk about this, the good fight? So we have another scripture or uh, some comments on the good fight, Terry? First um, Timothy six, verse twelve. He he encourages others to fight the good fight of the faith, to take hold of eternal life, and to which you were called. Okay, and so talking in that passage again to Timothy, again he encouraged Timothy. So he encouraged Timothy in the first letter to fight the good fight of faith. Now as he's about to die, he said that's what he's done. He set the example of that kind of fight. Why does he call it a good fight? Why is it the good fight? Susan. One of the sources I looked at said beautiful um, fight, but it was um, not an ordinary fight. It was a, a fruitful um, and good. Okay, so usually fight, I think we think of fighting as being something bad, something Christians should not participate in. is fighting that would be violent or harming people or whatever, but there is such a thing as a, a good fight. And a good fight, in this case, is a spiritual fight. Just like we read in many other passages, fighting for the, the faith, for the truth of the gospel. Not to hurt anybody, uh, and certainly not to hurt people physically, but for their, uh, to accomplish the victory of God and his, uh, his truth over Satan and his error. All right, so other passages on the fighting the good fight of faith. Bill? 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. All right, so that moves on to the second point, then does it, finishing the race. So he only compares his life to uh, a good fight, but he also compares it to running a race. And notice he says, I have fought the good fight. 
he realizes he's, he's about to the end of the fight. The fight's about over from his perspective. Likewise, the race is about over. I have finished the race. What are some other passages that talk about serving God as a, a race that uses that illustration? Steve, another one? In Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Okay, so serving God is not only like a spiritual warfare, it's also like a spiritual race. Okay, what are some similarities between serving God and, and a race? What are some ways that it's similar? Being in a race as compared to serving God in what way? What's the similarity? Terry. Well, in another scripture, Hebrews 10.32, says, Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering. So in both the fight and the spiritual warfare and the race, there is a struggle and, um, and suffering involved. All right, so both involve hardship, don't they? Whether it's warfare, we talked about that earlier in the book when he talked about that uh, one who fights in the cause of the Lord must be willing to suffer. But the same thing is true for running a race. Uh, if you're going to win the race, it's not easy. You have to put forth a sincere and dedicated effort. Uh, yeah. Also there in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, and anyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Okay, so that leads into the point he makes in just a moment about the crown. Let's talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. But another similarity is that there's a reward. Uh, there's a reward for the race. There's a reward for serving God. Okay, and a reward for uh, fighting the good fight. Okay, other comments on the, the fight or the race? Uh, Susie. Well, as Bill said, um, when you're running, you have to be temperate. If you want to win, you have to be temperate in all things. And uh, Hebrews also says, um, let us therefore lay aside every weight and sin that easily ensnares us. There's, there are a lot of hindrances, there are a lot of distractions um, in a race. We need to be aware of them, um, recognize that they're out there and avoid them. Okay, and he's already talked about some of that in chapter 2, didn't he, back in verse 4. We talked about in warfare, you don't entangle yourself in the affairs of this life. Uh, and in verse 5, if you compete as in athletics, you have to compete according to the rules. So a lot of similarities that are required uh, in order for one to win the race or to uh, be successful in the fight. Uh, and one has to control himself, has to exercise temperance, self-control in order to be victorious. Other comments on the fight or the race or other scriptures to Terry? Uh, also included in 1 Corinthians 9 is the idea in verse 24 that all that are in the race have to run it. And um, it's an individual effort that we have to make. We don't get to heaven as a group. We have to do it individually. Much of our athletics today, most of us sit and watch. That's our idea of our interest in sports, is watching other people compete. But that's not going to work. In this race, Paul had to run the race. Timothy had to run his own race. Each of us has to run our own race. We can't let somebody else run for us, and we can't just sit in the gallery and watch. We have to be participants in order to be victorious. Okay? Other comments on the fight or the race? Susie. Uh, also, we have we're not out there as though we have no guide in this race uh, Hebrews 12 2 says look unto Jesus follow him who's the author and finisher of our faith of our race okay so Jesus is our captain in the warfare he's uh, the leader of the, of the team you might say in the race the church the head of the church and so we have someone we have to imitate, someone we have to follow in order to be successful. So all of these things, very much similar. 
between these two. Uh, but then he says he's kept the faith. What does he mean when he says he's kept the faith? What's the significance of having kept the faith? Comments on that. What does the faith refer to? What does it mean by the faith? Rick. His belief in God and everything the scriptures has taught him. And he believes them wholeheartedly. And he's kept that on his mind day in, day out, whether he be in prison, whether he be in anywhere else. That's always been the forethought of what Paul was. Okay, so we've studied throughout first and second Timothy about the faith, haven't we? That which the gospel which we ought to believe, but it has to be a faith in our heart. We have to bring it into our to our lives, into our inner being, our inner spirit. And then we have to be devoted to it. And so rather than letting it go, so it's so easy in time of suffering or hardship to give up. And many people do. Uh, they get discouraged, they become upset, they think they shouldn't have to put up with this, it's too hard. Uh, they're because of opposition, uh, they're led astray, false teaching that we talked about. And so because of these things, sometimes people leave the faith. They let, uh, let go of their, the truth. Paul didn't do that. Paul kept the faith, and that's the example for us too. Same for us, if we're going to win the fight, win the race, we've got to hold tight to the faith and not give up. And he also on the keeping of the faith. Another comment, Susie. Uh, the idea that Paul recognized the necessity and the preciousness of that faith, um, that he guarded it, he watched over it, um, he wasn't going to let it get away from him. Okay, so the things that are valuable to us, that those are the things we keep, those are the things we hold on to, because we value them. If it wasn't important to us, uh, we wouldn't mind if we lost it uh, much. But this Paul values the faith that he believed and the faith that he held of that gospel message, and so he held on to it. When we are recognize the value of the gospel and what blessings it gives us, that our need to believe, then we'll keep the faith as we are more way. Anything else? Uh, Paul not only sort of guarded himself, but he didn't stop or stray from the plan that God had for him. He had sort of a special uh, thing to do for God. And he stayed with that. He did not leave it or stray from it. Okay. And so each of us has a race to run. Each of us has responsibilities. Different people may have somewhat different responsibilities uh, in the service of the Lord. But all of us have work to do. And we must maintain that uh, devotion. Okay, what reward does he say he would receive as a result of this in verse 8? What are, last part of verse 8, uh, well, actually the whole verse, what does he say is the reward for his faithfulness? What is he looking forward to? Eternal life. On eternal life, he calls it a crown of righteousness. Okay, he says, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only but also to all who have loved his appearing. So what, what is this crown of righteousness? I realize my illustration is not exactly the same kind of crown he's talking about. But uh, he's talking about a crown of righteousness. What would the crown of righteousness refer to? Well, it was Steve Barney actually uh, explained eternal life. But in what sense is that like a crown? What's the similarity between our reward and a crown? Susie. Victory. Victory. Okay. It's a simple victory, isn't it? The winner of the, of the fight, they're the victors. The one who wins the race is a victor. So the crown is a symbol of victory. And understand that in races in those days, they probably they certainly didn't have a crown like I've pictured, most likely a wreath. Uh, today, and some of you may no, no doubt have watched some of the Olympics uh, this summer, and we know the winners in the Olympics today are given a medal to indicate their victory. In those days, it was a wreath that they would wear on their on their head as a symbol of their victory okay but again that's a sim symbolism the, the fighting the race and the and the crown is all symbolism symbolic in this case of as steve said eternal life it's the crown of righteousness the crown you receive because you're right before god you receive uh eternal life 
Of course, some other passages that talk about that crown. There are others that discuss it, Rick. James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Okay, so again, the crown is the crown of life, you see. It tells us more about it. It's the crown of life. And as, as Paul says here, it's for those, not just for Paul, but for all who love his appearing, all those who will serve him faithfully. Bill? Uh, John 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed to all, all judgment to the Son. All right, so now he's talking about the judgment in that passage, isn't he? So the, there's going to be a judgment. Uh, just like you judged whether you win the race or not, there's going to be a judgment. But the judgment that we're talking about, of course, is the judgment day, at which Jesus will be the judge. And he will declare who has been uh, successful, who receives the reward or not. So Paul is convinced that he's fought the good fight, he's finished the race, he's kept the faith, and he's going to receive that crown. But every one of us can receive the same crown if we're willing to be willing to put forth the effort and be suffering for the cause of Christ, whatever it takes, that, uh, so that when he appears, when he comes again, we can have that reward. Okay? Other comments? Uh, Three verse eight. Uh, Frank. That uh, crown is eternal. The salvation is, is eternal. First Peter 5, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Okay, so there is no more important crown than what we're talking about right now. You win a, a race, a physical race, or win something in the Olympics, okay, that's nice, but uh, somebody else will win next time. Uh, it's a temporary thing. Back to 1 Corinthians 9 that uh, Bill read earlier. It's a, a perishable crown. It's not what it has, it has to do with this life, but we're looking for an imperishable crown, a crown that will give an eternal reward in heaven forever. Okay? Sharon. The fossil attitude in this section is so much different than the way the world looks at death. And he knows he's going to die, and Rome is certainly going to make sure that the process of dying is not going to be pleasant, but Paul's not saying, oh, Timothy, I'm afraid I'm going to die, and I need you to send me a bunch of lawyers, and I need you to send me all the bribe money you can gather from the Christians and help me get out of this. For Paul and for Christians, death is a victory, and it means going to be with the Lord forever, and that's the goal. And so um, it's a crown. It's a good thing. Okay, so that leads to some other discussion on question number 16. Uh, I ask, how does... Paul's statement here contrasts to what people often, today, often think of as, uh, as they view their past life. Other comments on how Paul views his past life as compared to how people today often view their lives. Terry? Well, Paul looked with um, desire to what was coming next. He, he knew he was ready. He knew he had kept the faith. And he knew what was promised to him. The wicked look with fear at death because they are not prepared. They don't know what's ahead. Uh, some of them don't know what's ahead. They're just afraid of it. And some of them are afraid of it because they do know what's ahead for them. Okay. The faithful Christian who has served God faithfully and dedicated can look forward to the future. But so often, people who have uh, lived their lives for themselves, for material pursuits, uh, things of this world, maybe immorality, but if not immorality, maybe just things that are temporary, rather than emphasizing service to God, uh, they have nothing to look back to. When, when life is over, that's the end of whatever in pleasure or enjoyment they had. There's nothing more to look forward to for them. And as Terry pointed out, in many cases, it's fearful because they know there's nothing good ahead of them. Okay, other comments on Paul's attitude compared to other people? Susie. Well, 
Paul's attitude is clearly seen in his letter to the Philippians in the third chapter uh, uh, from verses um, 3 through I don't know, 9 or 10 that he has no confidence in this his in the flesh in his physical tabernacle um, and he counts everything in this life as rubbish compared to gaining the victory in the resurrection of Christ. So if our emphasis is on this life and the things involved of a physical nature, uh, when this life is over, there's nothing more for us, nothing good. Uh, all of our values have been placed on that which is temporary. But like Paul, the Christian is looking forward to that which he really values after this life to be rewarded eternally, eternally when this life is over. Okay, anything else went through verse 8? Well, let's read a little bit more, and uh, as Paul, now, he's really bringing the letter to a close now, and really the final statements that we have from him from his life. Let's read verse 9 through 12. Would I like to read verse 9 through 12 for us, please? We're getting into some names here that uh, may be a little bit difficult. Verse 9 through 12, would I like to read that for us, please? Steve. Be diligent to come to me quickly. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, he has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for the ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with the carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Okay, thank you. All right, so he had earlier talked about the fact that he was hoping uh, to be able to see Timothy again. He talked about that earlier in the uh, letter. But now as he's about to uh, close the letter, he's encouraging Timothy again. He wants him to come to him. But he has some, some th something that's really troubling him, and I suppose he assumes that Timothy knows all these people he's talking about. We don't know them, but Timothy would have. Uh, the first one he mentions is Demas, and what does he have to say about Demas? Verse 10. What does he tell us about Demas? Demas, he says, has forsaken me. Why? What had led him to forsake? Okay, he says he's loved this present world. So I ask you some uh, to discuss, well, first of all, uh, where else we've read about Demas, and then uh, some other passages, question number 20 about the attitude towards the world. Here is somebody, in contrast to we've been talking about, about Paul, who's lived to serve the Lord, and now he has to look forward to a crown of life Here's Demas, who he's emphasizing this physical world like we've been talking about. So what are some passages that talk about that or other passages that mention Demas? Somebody have another scripture for us? We're looking down through question number 20 now. Anybody? Susie. Well, uh, Colossians 4, 14 mentions that uh, Luke and Demas were with Paul when he wrote the book of Colossians. Uh, and when he wrote to the Philippians, he said he referred to Demas as his fellow laborer. So something happened, uh, perhaps, perhaps fearing persecution and death by like Paul, or whatever, um, he persecuted. So Demas has earlier been mentioned in one of Paul's earlier letters as one of his co-workers. I mean, he wasn't just... Uh, somebody who was converted a week or so ago and then fell away. He'd been involved with Paul. He'd, he'd seen the, the miracles Paul was able to do. He'd heard the preaching and teaching. He'd been a companion of Paul. And yet even someone like that uh, could lose their faith and fall away. That's what Paul is trying to encourage Timothy not to do. Demas is the bad example of which Paul is a good example. What else about Demas? Anything else? Bill. Colossians 4, verse 14 says, 
with the beloved physician and Demas greet you. All right, so we're going to look some more about Luke in just a moment, aren't we? Uh, that Luke is still with him. He's going to say here in Second uh, Timothy chapter four. Uh, but whereas Luke stayed with him, Demas forsook him. So they, they, they'd been both of them had been his companions, but one remained and one left. Okay. Other comments about uh, about the world. Other passages about the dangers of the world. Yeah, Terry. First John two fifteen. Um, tells us to love, not to love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Okay. Demas forsook having loved the present world. John, by inspiration, says, don't love the world. Don't love the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now, those things are of the world and they're temporary. Those who love the Lord, that's what's eternal. That's what lasts. Okay. Other passages about the world. And the danger, that error that Demas made. Anybody else? Susie. James 4.4, 4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. All right, make yourself a friend of the world. You become an enemy of God. That's what Demas did. Now, I, it doesn't really say why. Susie mentioned the possibility that maybe it was the persecution that Paul is warning Timothy about. Maybe that's what caused him to forsake. But if the passage only tells us he loved the world. He was more concerned about that. And so he left for Thessalonica. And some of the other people then that he mentions had gone to other places. The Crescens had gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. These are other areas. Galatia is in what we would call Asia Minor. And Dalmatia is north of Macedonia. And so only Luke, he says, is still, is still with him. Why do you suppose Paul is mentioning these things? We're going to talk about it, some more about it. But why do you think he's talking about it? Demas went here and Crescens went there and... Titus went here, and why is he talking about these things? Well, is it to help Timothy understand what may be ahead for him? He'll have some faithful workers and some not. All right, so one lesson is that's going to happen to us too, isn't it, Timothy? And not just Timothy, but us. There are going to be some who remain faithful and some who don't. And I, I don't know how many of you have observed this or thought, even thought about it, but uh, I know over the years, there are people that, Christians, part of congregations that I knew years ago, that I thought, well, I don't know if those folks are going to make it or not. They've really got to struggle. Uh, it's really, uh, it seems like it's touch and go with those folks. And I go back and years later, and here they are still doing what's right, still serving God. And on the other hand, there are people, oh, these are strong people, they're really doing good. They come back later and they've fallen away. Uh, so a person's attitude it's, it's not just your opportunity. It's not just, uh, it's certainly not your physical advantages. It's your devotion to the Lord. It's going to make the difference in whether you remain faithful or you don't. Some did, some didn't. Okay, Bill. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Okay, so it's one or the other, isn't it? You can't love the world and love the Father too. You have to make a choice. Only one master, not two masters in this world, like Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24. You can't love him and love uh, material possessions, too. Okay, but now that he says, so these people have gone. Luke is still with him. Of course, we know about Luke. I don't know much about these other people. Well, Titus, of course, he's going to have a letter written to him. We'll study the Lord willing later on. But Luke is with him. Of course, Luke wrote the book of Luke and the gospel, or the, uh, rather the book of Acts. But who does he want? Timothy to bring to him in verse 11. He wants Timothy to bring who? Neil. Mark. Mark. Now, is there a, what does he say about Mark? What is his observation about why he wants Mark to come to? Rick. He says he's useful to his ministry. He's going to be useful to me in the ministry, that is in the work, in the preaching, the gospel, and so on. But what is why is that noteworthy that he would say this about Mark? How does it differ from the past history of Mark? Okay. Mark had apparently been with Paul on the first journey, and we don't know why, but for some reason he, he, he left. And later that became a source of conflict in Acts 15. What resulted because Mark left on that first journey? 
what happened later on. Terry. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement over whether to take him or not. And Barnabas takes him and goes one way, and Paul takes Silas and goes another way. All right. So, as they were about to start on the second journey, Paul and Barnabas had been on the first journey together, and Mark, had, Mark was Barnabas' nephew. But Mark had deserted the work, and Paul didn't want to take him on the second journey. He was afraid it might be the same problem again. Didn't have confidence in him. But Barnabas wanted to take him, and they disagreed over it, and they decided to separate. And so Barnabas took Mark, and they went to preach, and Paul took Silas, and they went on the second Paul's second preaching trip. So at that point, Paul didn't have confidence in Mark. He was concerned that he would not stay with the work, but like some others he's talking about, would desert the work again maybe, or at least be tempted to do so. But the difference now is, he says, bring him, bring him. He's useful in the ministry. So what do we learn from that? What are some lessons we can learn from that? Some people need time to grow, and we all need people like Barnabas to give us that time and to encourage us to continue doing what is right, even though we may have fallen um, in the beginning. Okay, so just because someone has done wrong in the past doesn't mean they're going to continue to do wrong. Now, I Maybe you have a different viewpoint of Acts 15. I don't think either Paul or Barnabas was wrong there. It was a matter of judgment. Uh, but Barnabas obviously did help Mark, and that's good. And in the end, Paul then recognized that Mark had grown, and he could now be useful, and he wanted him with him. So uh, people change, people mature, people grow. Our view of people can change because of their growth and their maturity. And so at this point, Mark is... Uh, Useful, Paul says to him, and wants him there. Other comments through verse 11. Anybody else? Okay, so now some other people he talks about. He sent Tychicus to Ephesus. And then verse 13, what else does he want Timothy to do in verse 13? Something else he wants Timothy to do when he comes is what? Verse 13. Bring he wants him to bring a cloak, books, and especially the parchments. Uh, he says he left with the uh, carpus at Troas. Mm -hmm. Comments on that? What are you? Uh, any observations on, on this? I ask you some questions about it. Um, questions number um, 26 and 27. What does it tell you about it? Paul? Anything? Frank? Well, concerning the cloak, I suppose uh, weather getting colder he felt that he needed that his uh, interest in the scriptures God's word needing need those written uh, books and parchments to study okay so we don't know exactly he doesn't explain himself but probably the cloak was that he's going to get winter was coming on he need to stay warm and but then he doesn't say what the books are but presumably they were copies of scripture that kind of thing most likely uh, so Paul was a human being you know sometimes we read the stories of these men and, and it, it, we tend to maybe overlook the fact that they have the same kind of needs that you and I have uh, and they need garments to keep them uh, warm they need food and, and these kinds of things and they have the same kind of, same kind of needs that we have in and we see even the value for a preacher to have material to study. Uh, Paul was inspired, and yet even so he needed, wanted to have these written materials that he could help him in his study and his teaching and so on. Okay, other comments or discussion through verse 13, anybody? Uh, 